Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Q Baptist Night Church this evening. If you haven't already, come in and grab a seat. Front rows are always the best seats. Great to have you joining with us this evening. My name is Lauren. Uh, Welcome to those who are tuning in online from home as well. It's great to gather together for this time of worship on this, albeit a little bit chilly, Sunday evening. Well, as we get underway tonight, uh, I think there's no better way to start any gathering of worship than by grounding ourselves in the truth of God um, and in Scripture. Um, So we're going to look into uh, Israel's worship songbook, the book of Psalms, looking at Psalm 145. And can I encourage you to pull this out in front of you? Uh, This is not just something for me to read, but for all of us to read. And sometimes it's just nice to have it tangibly in your own hands as well. So Psalm 145, if you're using the Pew Bibles, it's on page 624. Or if you prefer, you can just pull it up on your Bible app or, or whatever works for you. Psalm 145. I'm just going to read a few verses from this for us tonight. It's a Psalm of David, and he writes, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And if you cast your eyes down the rest of this psalm, it goes on for another 20 or so verses. And he goes on to say it's just some of the many wonderful reasons that God is worthy of our praise. He talks about God's awesome works. He talks about how the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He talks about God as provider and sustainer, that he is trustworthy, that he is faithful, that he abounds in love. There is so many wonderful, rich things about this psalm, but What I want to draw your attention to as we start tonight is actually just that opening stanza, which I'll read again. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Now, the reason I love those words is because the choice of phrasing is not just a statement of present fact. It's also a dedication of future intent. I will exalt you. I will praise you. Every day, I will. It's not just a fleeting emotional experience spur of the moment. It is a deliberate choice, a choosing to worship God every day. And that's the same choice that we get to make each day. It is, I think, sometimes all too easy to just be governed by our emotions and our feelings and our whims, and we just sort of do what we feel like. And then that can mean we have a culture of only worshipping God when we feel like it, instead of making that choice to live by faith each day, remembering God's goodness, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the choice that we get to make tonight, and you are already making it by being here or by tuning in online. You're making that choice to be here in this place of worship So church, let's press in tonight. Let's make that choice together because whether we are in mountaintop experiences or walking through the darkest valley in times of abundance and in times of great need, God is still God. He is still so worthy of our praise. So let us choose to worship him tonight. Let us choose to exalt the Lord our God. Will you stand with me? And as we prepare to sing, I want to pray for us. Please stand. Lord God, as your people in this place tonight, we humbly want to make this choice. We want to choose you, God. We want to press in to you. We choose to exalt you, our God and our King. We choose to praise you, for you are so worthy of our praise, regardless of our circumstances, Lord. And we know that you see each one of us, you see our hearts, you know what we are carrying as we come into this place tonight, as we engage with this service tonight, you see where we are, you see our needs. But Lord, in every season, you are still God, you are still so worthy of our praise. So we press into you, Lord, living not by feelings, but by faith, making that choice. We choose to worship you, we will exalt you. We will exalt you, for you are our God. 
Amen. Let's sing together. Just take a minute to get ready to sing. Because you're with me. My hiding place. My 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. Thank you that we can come together as your church. And we ask that you help us to turn our hearts and our minds towards you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Luke and the team. What a wonderful way to start the service. Whew. Just need to take a moment. It was wonderful. Well, if you have just joined us, uh, let me just extend another welcome. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm one of the pastors serving on the ministry team here at Q Baptist Church. It's great to have you with us for our evening service tonight. Uh, if you are new or visiting, uh, if you're keen to find out more about our church or perhaps join a small group or a Bible study or just find out more about who we are, we encourage you to fill out one of our Connect forms. Uh, you can scan the handy QR code that's up on the screen. It'll take you to the online form. I'll uh, just come and introduce yourself. I'd love to chat to you after the service and get to know you, help connect you into the community here. Uh, well, lots of good things happening around the place. Uh, tonight we are continuing our Genesis series, journeying through the story of Abraham and Sarah, and our interim pastor Jeff will be bringing us the next instalment looking at Genesis 21, so we look forward to that. A few other important things to bring to your attention, uh, particularly I want to announce an upcoming church-wide prayer night that's coming up on Wednesday the 10th of August, that's Wednesday week. Um, so this is being overseen by the Pastoral Search Committee. As many of you will know, we are still in the process of searching for a long-term senior pastor. And as a church, we are being invited to this prayer night as an opportunity to really press into God, to come together as a whole church family and really commit this process and these decisions uh, to God. So I encourage you to come along. If you are in a small group who usually meets on a Wednesday night, uh, we encourage you to come as a small group to the prayer night. Uh, it's at 7.30 p.m. over in Newnham Hall, just two doors down. It'll go for about, I think, 45 minutes or so. Um, we'd really love to see every person there. So that's Wednesday week on the 10th of August. Also coming up next Sunday night, which is the 7th of August, we are having a curry night. So after the service, don't worry about making dinner plans. Dinner is already sorted. Uh, we're going to have a range of delicious hot curries that are going to be served just right up in the back of the church building. You literally don't have to go anywhere. It is going to be wonderful. So look forward to that. That's happening next Sunday night. And just one other announcement, uh, just more of a, a pastoral update uh, from the ministry team. Many of you will see this by email and Facebook, but just to remind you again, uh, Miriam Dale, who is our wonderful, incredible uh, church administrator and pastoral care coordinator, just a reminder, she is taking some extended leave at the moment um, to be present with her family in the ever-increasing complexities of her mother's health um, and that difficult journey they're going through. Um, so respect her, her space and her privacy at this time. If you do have any church-related matters that you need help or input on, rather than contacting Miriam directly, uh, respect that she's on leave and just direct those inquiries directly to the office. Uh, myself, Beth Hanlon, Jeff, we're still all around and we're happy to help. Um, but also, can I encourage you to be really upholding Miriam and her family in prayer? Um, this is a, a difficult season that they're walking together, um, but it's a wonderful opportunity for us as her church family to really get around her um, and pray for her. So I commend that to you. Well, as we do every week in our rhythms of worship, uh, we take a moment to acknowledge our tithes and our offerings. Uh, this is something for the regular members of Q Baptist Church as we contribute to the kingdom work um, through the mission and ministry of Q Baptist Church. Uh, in these COVID times, we don't pass a physical bowl around, uh, but we do like to take a moment in the service to still acknowledge it. Uh, it is an act of worship, even if it's just little numbers being automatically deducted out of your bank account each week. Uh, it's a good thing not to just set and forget like you might do with other direct debits, um, but to really prayerfully acknowledge what it is that we do when we offer some of our finances uh, back to God and his kingdom work here. Um, so I encourage you to just take a moment with me um, as we prayerfully reflect on that and pray for these gifts before God. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, we acknowledge you as our creator, our provider, our sustainer. We acknowledge that all that we have is yours. And we offer these, these gifts and these tithes to you now, Lord, the, the money that's come out of our accounts during the week or, or that will come out this week and the weeks to come. Lord, we offer it to you humbly and, and cheerfully. Uh, we don't give out of compulsion or, or obligation or, or bitterness or resentment, but Lord, we do so freely 
as an act of thanksgiving and love and worship uh, in recognition of your goodness and your grace um, and the wonderful invitation that we have to partner with you in your kingdom work. Lord, you choose us to partner with you. So we thank you that we get to be a part of your mission and your ministry. And we pray that you would take these gifts, that you would bless them and use them to further your kingdom. We pray for your blessing over these gifts and the givers in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, my name's Peter and it's my privilege now to lead us in prayer together. Would you join me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we, your people, come and seek you. We come to bring our prayers and to hear from you, for you are the God we trust. All around us there are other voices, other attractions, other tantalising schemes looking for our trust, that we would put our hope in them. They might please us for a time, they might amuse us, and entrance us, but in the end they are empty, hollow and destructive. Forgive us, your people, when we have listened to these other voices, to other things apart from you. Turn our hearts to you. Seek us and find us, Lord. Change us from the inside out. Transform our spirit to be one with your Holy Spirit. Let us be of one mind with Christ. You are our God of hope and in you we put our trust. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. We pray for our church family today. And we particularly pray for Miriam and her family. In the midst of illness and struggle, be their hope and strength. Come close and be their loving father, wrapping your arms around them. For our ministry team and our leadership team, we continue to pray. In this time of transition, challenge and pressing workloads, be their strength and comfort. Continue to lead, guide and sustain them and encourage us to reach out and help where we have skills and where we might be hands and feet bringing love to them. We pray for the seeking of a new senior pastor, for wisdom and leading and the power of your spirit. For the pastoral search committee and our church community, guide us. And we look to you to bring the right person by the calling of your spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for our cross-cultural workers, those who are serving you in places far and wide across the world. Thank you for their obedience to your calling. We pray that they might prosper in bringing your word of love and grace to the communities they serve. And tonight we pray in particular for Anthony and Jacqueline. We thank you for Anthony sharing with us tonight. And we pray that you'll go with them in a couple of weeks' time as they return. That you might be with them and strengthen them and hold them as they return to their mission in South Asia. That you might reach out to those people to whom they serve. And we pray that as they bring your word of love and grace to the communities they serve, that we too would bring them in our minds and hearts regularly so that we too can support them through our prayers daily. And this week we've been reminded of our fellow Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith 
in, ha- in ways we can hardly fathom or believe or understand, in brutality, abductions and murders and other horrors. Lord, we don't understand why this happens, but we stand with them and pray for them, for strength, courage and your grace and mercy. These, your children who trust in you, we pray for them and lift them before your throne of grace. Our Heavenly Father, you are the God in who we place our trust and everything we are. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Please stand as we sing together. God, I look to you.
Evening all, my name's Maddie and I'll be reading the Bible for you today. Um, we'll be reading from Genesis 21, um, that's on page 19 of your pew Bibles, and we'll be going through the whole chapter. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when, Isaac, when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah, to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw the son who, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. At the time of Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces said to sorry, page stuff, Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me and the country where you now reside as a foreigner the same kindness I have shown to you. Abraham said, I swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham bought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set, two Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock, and Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs you have set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba, because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. We'll get Jeff up. We'll pray for him before he speaks. <clears throat> Father God, uh, I just thank you for Jeff um, and everything that you've been preparing in him to bring before us tonight. I also thank you for... All of the sermons that you've uh, preached through him and the other pastors on Abraham and Sarah's lives that led up to this night. 
Um, I just thank you for the way that you intend to expand upon what we've learned um, and bring new insight through Jeff tonight. Um, I just pray that you'll be with him as he speaks and you'll touch the hearts of those in this room tonight who hear the words that you speak through him. I pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that wonderful prayer. And, um, and yes, it is a privilege to um, be able to open this story. I hope you've noticed as we've moved through this very rich and important part of Scripture that um, it, it takes a different way of reading. Sure, the stories are interesting in and of themselves. Uh, there's, there's a lot happening and uh, they're memorable. But uh, we've got to realise that, again, these stories are written that we may learn God, that we might see what it is to be the people of God and understand how to trust him and believe in him. These are theological stories. Uh, they teach us about God. They're freighted with a lot of uh, uh, heavy-duty information. Uh, we've just got to be able to look for it and know how to find it. Now, you've also noticed that as we move through these, these chapters, these 10, 11, 12 chapters about Abraham, they're, they're, they're woven together like a plait or like, a, like a, a bit of rope. And so characters appear in one chapter, then go under the surface and then come up again somewhere else. And, and they develop and these, these characters are brought back onto the stage. And we've got to understand this is how the writer is, is developing the theology and how to understand what it is to be a people of faith in this God, Yahweh. And this story uh, um, concerns certain characters which we, we read about in tandem, the two women, Abram's wife, Sarah, uh, the woman that has the promise of a son that takes a long time to come, and the slave woman who was her maidservant, Hagar, uh, who also has a son. So for two women, two sons, there are two exit stories, one where uh, Hagar runs away after being persecuted by Sarah and this one where she's driven out. Uh, there are two promises of God to these two sons and these two stories then they come to this head in chapter 21, surrounded by chapter 20, and the end of chapter 21, we just read this crazy story about seven sheep and a well. And uh, these, these arrangements themselves are quite deliberate narrative techniques to get across the point. It's like the story that we're reading tonight is like a sandwich where the good stuff's in the middle, but the sandwich tells us the theology that we're meant to see in the middle. And that's the nature of this sort of uh, sandwich structure. Now, <clears throat> if we could just recap back to Lauren's sermon two or three weeks ago, was on this, this powerful story of uh, Sarah who faced with the delayed promise, uh, and there was a whole lot of cultural stuff happening here, um, <clears throat> she decides that uh, God's promise needs helping along. Now, at this stage... God had promised this child when Abram was 75 and Sarah would have been 65. And uh, nothing happens up until chapter 16 when now, nine or ten years later, there's still no kid. They're getting older, they're getting desperate, as Lauren pointed out. And Sarah decides the Lord's will needs a little bit of helping along. I suspect that she had a little bit of residual paganism happening there and she thought that if she handed her maidservant to Abram, it might excite the juices in the heavenlies and like a good fertility worshipper, that she might become fertile. That actually has these words that, um, that she might grow up or develop and that was her hope. And now she hands this maidservant to her husband as a wife, not just as a concubine. In 1610, she is a wife. It's meant to be just in name only. But as the days go by, she starts to notice that Hagar is sort of taking liberties and she's hanging around the family acre a little bit too much. 
She should be out the back with the other maid servants peeling spuds and folding washing, but she and Abraham seem to have a thing going on. He's a little bit interested in this young, fertile woman. And rivalry takes over, and, and Sarah gets very snitchy and basically tells uh, Abram that this woman's got to go. And uh, Abram says, and I think it's a sign of his guilt, that immediately he realises he's been caught out in his thought world, and his wives know these things, and he basically says, she's all yours, <laughs> don't, 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 she's still a slave, uh, she's all yours, hands are over, and Sarah gets the nails out and starts really grinding into the life of Hagar. Hagar can't handle it, she runs to the bush, takes her child, and there the Lord finds her. She fled somewhere to a... Have we got this map? Let's see. Now, sorry about all those arrows there. It's, um, you know, I think I got this map off Dole, Dole before you dig. But um, uh, I don't know what they mean. <laughs> but um, uh, you can just see there's a guess of Gera. Abram now has moved from Mamre right in the middle. Remember the Oaks of Mamre? And he's been happy there. And he's, he's, a, he's got to move around to find land for his livestock. And so he moves down into Philistine territory, a big city of Gera where the king is a king indeed. He has his own militia. He's a pretty heavy duty guy. And this is where it all is happening. Now, we're not quite sure, but we're pretty sure that past Rehoboth, down about where, those, where the gas meets the electricity, that's, uh, that's where this woman flees to. It's quite a trek. And she's gone down to this um, wadi, uh, where the Lord finds her. And I find it interesting that he comes to comfort her and he says, uh, you know, what are you doing here? And she just has no plan. She just says, well, you, know, you ought to know I'm being persecuted and you know, this is why I'm here. And, and it's fascinating that as the Lord, it says three times that he spoke to her. And, and uh, he says, return to your mistress and submit to her. No movement, no comment. That doesn't sound a great idea. Then the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord manifesting himself, said to her, I'll surely multiply your offspring so that it can be numbered for a multitude. You know, good things are around the corner. No comment, no movement. And then the angel of the Lord said, <clears throat> behold, you're pregnant and shall bear a son. and You'll call his name Ishmael. The Lord names this child Ishmael. Because the Lord has listened to your reflection. So the name actually means God hears. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. <laughs> and he'll be, his hand will be against everyone and his, everyone's hand against him and he'll dwell over against his enemies. I mean, he's going to bring conflict into the family of Abraham. At that point, she's all ears. And she thinks, hmm. And so she calls the name of the Lord. She worships him. And she says, therefore, you have seen what I've been going through. That's terrific. And therefore, the well was called Beer Laharoi, which lies between Kadesh and Barit. Basically, she's interested when it means retribution. And she's heading home. Uh, but uh, knowing that the Lord is on her side in the form of her son, who will be a thorn in Sarah's side. Now, that's, we need to know that when we come to this story. And then in chapter 21, in verses 1 to 7, we finally have the final proof of God's faithfulness to his covenant. And he, he comes out and uh, um, we read uh, the uh, very first verse there. I'll turn back to it. <clears throat> uh, the Lord visited Sarah, as he said, uh, and several times he's pointed it out. And we've been waiting for this for 25 years and what astounds me is how understated it is. As Sarah conceived, she boils a son in the time that God had said. She calls him Isaac. He's circumcised on the eighth day. It's very, you know, it's like a police diary account of the thing. Uh, not very dramatic. I would have thought it would be a lot more fanfare, a lot more isn't that great stuff, but there it is, matter of fact. And Sarah herself finishes this little section and says, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears about this will laugh over me, uh, maybe not at me, but laugh over me. That's so hilarious that God has been able to do this amazing thing. 
as uh, remember she was the one who laughed when the first time she heard about this crazy scheme. So, yeah, this is the culmination, and it's so important theologically that here God has made this promise which seemed absolutely impossible, and he lets it drag out so it's totally impossible just to prove that this is the God who creates things out of nothing and he needs no help, and he makes this child come out uh, uh, in his good time. And that's uh, the nature of this God that is, is trying to demonstrate how he works through these stories and through these people and these characters. But then we jump ahead and in the next paragraph, in verse 8, we read, the child grew and was weaned. And this is three years later. Now, at this time, Ishmael is 17 years old. And you can do the maths and work that out. Uh, Abraham was 84 when Ishmael was born. And now he's 100. 16, actually 14. 14 plus 3, that's 17. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, he, uh, he finally um, is weaned and Abraham makes a great feast on that day. That's a significant thing in the ancient world when a child is now, you're confident the child is going to live. They're not dependent on their mother totally all the time and uh, so that's a festivity. Now, when you throw a feast, these sorts of feasts, they, they were drinking fests. That's a celebration that we're thinking of here. And I think that's what's behind this. This is more like Oktoberfest than the royal show. It's really, you know, uh, and, and people overindulge. And in the middle of that, wherever alcohol crops up in this, uh, this book of Genesis, it always means trouble and terrible things happen and people get themselves into all sorts of situations that they never live down. And... Uh, this is the sort of thing that happens here. here Sarah saw Hagar's son. <coughs> we, we don't get the name. It's all depersonalised. Not Ishmael. It's the son of Hagar the Egyptian whom she brought to, born to Abraham. And the word is, it's translated in our version, mocking. But it's really the word laughing. You see, there's this play on this word laughter all the way through. And we're deliberately meant to see that. And I think the kid was just tipsy and uh, he is overindulge and he's a bit goofy. And, and uh, Sarah sees that and, and suddenly the penny drops. And she sees this lad and transfers a whole lot of stuff that's been pent up about his mum, probably looks like his mum, probably sounds like his mum, and the resentment that she has been storing away for years suddenly comes out through the fissure of that laughter. And she is uh, really angry. And now, why is she angry? One, because Abram is 100, and I don't think he's going to make 200. He's uh, close to cashing in his chips, so to speak. And Ishmael legally, is the firstborn son. And in the law of courts of this country, the firstborn son gets a double portion more than all the other children, how many there are. And the rest of the kids have to divide up the lot. He gets the big share. And yet he's not the child of promise. Isaac is. And so she, she is uh, adamant and she gets to Abraham and she says, cast out this slave woman with her son for the son of this slave woman. You can tell she's not exactly on Sarah's uh, party list, is she? Shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Uh, she sees Isaac as a rival as she saw Hagar as a rival. Now Isaac is a rival to her son's legitimate fortune. And cast out is a legal term. It doesn't just mean send out. It really means divorce. Rip up the contract with this woman. Let's make this legal that she has no truck and trade in this family. That's what she's on about. Now this really saddens Abram because he has grown to love this child. And this child is his son. And yet he has to conceive that Isaac is the son of promise. 
and he's sad in this day, but God comes to console him in the next verse and says, don't be sad because this boy uh, of the son of your slave woman, do what Sarah says. And through Isaac, you know, this Sarah idea all the way along was uh, rich and foolish. Isaac is the, the son of promise and he is the one that's going to uh, bring the blessing that I've been talking about. And, and uh, so do as you will. But also, I'm going to bless this particular son, Ishmael, because just because he's your offspring. And so Abraham responds positively. And uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, next day, he gets up early and he gets to um, put Sarah and Ishmael away. Isn't it fascinating? And I find it fascinating. She's been a slave. She's served this family for 20 years. I'm, I'm getting a bit of echo here. Are you troubled by that? No? Yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> and so she's, uh, she's uh, 20 years of service that she's done. And, um, and look what Abraham does. He basically gives her a skin of water, enough to get through half a day, and a cut lunch. Now, this is a guy that has been blessed and blessed and blessed. You would have thought he could spare an ass or a camel or an, you know, an old donkey with bad teeth, but he doesn't give her anything. He just pops his skin over her shoulder. And I think he pops the son's hand on her shoulder because in the early morning glare, this boy is uh, still getting over the, the night before. And off they go towards a wilderness called the wilderness of Beersheba. And off she heads. Now, is that mean-spiritedness? Is that sheer injustice? Is that fear of Sarah? I think not. I think what is happening here is a mark of incredible faith that Abram trusts what God has just said to him that this God, whether it be short time or long, keeps his promise. And he's got his own son there as a witness to the fact Isaac is the promise that no one could have believed. And God has said that he's going to provide for this boy and he's going to be a father of many. He's going to have kings and nations coming from him. This is the God in Abraham's book that he has learnt the hard way through the foolishness of that couple that this God doesn't need their help. And so he doesn't give them any help. God is their help and he will look after them. And so off they go. It's fascinating that we're told here that this one goes off as the child she goes with the child. It's not because the author is confused about what a 17-year-old is. It's because, as parents can only know, your children, especially in times of predicament, are your children. They are, you see the child they were as you see them in adulthood. They're always the child, despite their actual stature. Now, when the water and the skin was gone, and this is probably just a few hours later, then we read about this dreadful story, amazing story, where it says, in my version, she put the child under a bush. Right? They run out of food, they run out of water, they're in a wilderness. She'd set off and she'd just been following little thickets after thickets because where things grow, there must be water, I guess. And so this is what she's done. She's just followed grove after grove on the horizon until she saw the next one. She's been wandering around, maybe even in circles, and finally she's run out of water and she's run out of energy and her son is dying of dehydration, probably due to some of the stuff he's consumed the day before. And there she hears him in his death throes. There's not much she can do. And uh, so... What does she do? It's fascinating here. We mustn't misinterpret what she does. When it says that she put the child under one of these, it's actually that word that we read earlier, cast. She cast him. Now, she didn't toss him under a bush. She cast him under the bush. 
That is, what she is doing is doing something morally, something legally. She's relinquishing her motherhood for the sake of the survival of this child. How could that be? And then she goes off and it says, you know, good bow shot in the distance. And she says, let me not look at the death of this child. She just prays to no one in particular. But what she's praying is not that she won't see it, but let the death not happen. (laughs) This is what she's getting at. And I think... What she's doing is the same thing that centuries later, 500 years later, the mother of Moses does exactly the same thing and it's the same language in the book of Exodus where the mother of Moses is about to lose her son because of a divine, a a kingly decree and, you know, the story, Sunday school story, she puts her kid in the basket, pushes him down the Nile and she goes off a certain distance in eyeshot to watch what happens. And this is what Sarah is doing. She's putting that kid out there in the vain and forlorn hope that someone might be travelling this way towards water. And if they see her, he's her responsibility. But if they find him, they just, on a slim chance, might find economic value in her son and acquire him for themselves. This is her hope. This is why she moves out of sight and out of earshot that this kid might have a chance of survival and she has relinquished her motherhood. She wanted to be with this child. Can you imagine any mother at the point of which a child is dying? I can remember being in my last minute of life as a 6-year-old and I can remember what my mother was doing. She was disobeying every command of every nurse and every, every doctor in that ward. They weren't going to get her an inch away from me as I was drowning after a bad operation. And that's what she would do. That's what every mother would do. But this mother, she's not saving her own skin. She's saving his. She moves away. That's the last card that she's got to play. And she leaves that card in God's hands. Nobody comes. The minutes tick away. She can't help. Just sobbing and weeping as she hears the death rattle in the distance. At that point, we read that the Lord intervenes a second time and we read that he hears the boy's cry. He doesn't answer her prayer. He he himself picks up on this kid's distress. And he says to her, take him in your hand again, which is an amazing statement. And effectively it is saying, take up the mantle of motherhood again. Grasp him. Take on that role because I have got plans for this boy. And she fills him in as she has, as he has re- recently filled uh, Abraham in on the same destiny of this one. I'm going to make him into a great nation. And by the way, lift up your eyes because just over there there's a well. And that's the first step in the story of Ishmael. And he goes on and becomes the father of the Ishmaelites who elsewhere in scripture are called the Midianites. You've heard of them. In our day, in our centuries, they're called the Bedouin. They are the people who come from this promise as witness to God in our day and our time. And he lives in the wilderness. He becomes an expert with the bow and uh, his mother steps out of the family and gets him married to an Egyptian. Now, that's a, a fascinating thing. What I think it is telling us is something which you need to see in the light of the stupid story that's tacked onto this, a story about a king and Abraham having an argument about a well. Now, just to run you back, we haven't looked at chapter 20, but what has happened is, remember Abraham, he he blows it again, he goes into Philistine territory, he acts just the same way as he did down in Egypt, he says to Sarah, you know, pretend you're my sister, 
Hair gets taken into the harem. She must have been one incredible 90-year-old. I mean, I must have one of them. <laughs> I like older women. <laughs> but what was it? And she's taken to the harem again, and he, um, he is then... Uh, uh, the king is judged by God, and, and God says, I'm going to strike you dead. You know, that's, a, you know, that's the apple of my eye, that, that woman and that man's... Uh, that the man that owns that woman, that's, he's my special prophet. Now, it's because of that that Abimelech again does the same sort of thing and he does the right thing. He hands Sarah back and he's blessed by God and he blesses Abraham and his own wives start bearing children, etc. That's happened before this. But you see, Abimelech now knows that in his territory lives someone who is inordinately dangerous. And he just wants to get some sort of legal safeguard with this guy who's marauding around with a God who strikes you dead if you do the wrong thing by him. He wants to be on the right side of this guy. Let's have a covenant. Abraham says, oh, yeah, let's do that. Let's shake on that. And just as they're about to deal in the covenant and set it up, Abraham goes, oh, I've got a little gripe. And he brings out the fact that I, I, I dug a well here recently you see, this story, it just says it happens around the same time as this other story. I dug a well here and your blokes are pushing my blokes out of it. It's for my cattle, it's for my sheep. Uh, you know, I want that settled. And, and so how are we going to do this? Here, here's seven of my best sheep. Now, the idea is that if you accepted a gift, you're into a contract. You take these seven sheep, we have a contract that this is my well. Got that? Abimelech says, whatever you want. <laughs> He's not about to ruffle feathers of Abraham, the guy with strings in heaven. And so he accepts a sheep. And that's why this place, this wilderness into which this woman drifts aimlessly around in circles, seemingly going nowhere, this place is called Beersheba, the well of the seven, to this day. Anyone interested in First World War history knows that our armed forces did some pretty remarkable things around Beersheba in the First World War. It's such a strategic point because it's the only water for miles around. Battles were fought over weeks in 50 degrees centigrade in the First World War to get those, those that well at Beersheba. You see, what has happened here? The Lord is saying something about how he works, that even before this woman was cast out, this slave woman was sent out and divorced, sent out into nowhere, the Lord had already used the free decisions of rather fragile and, and flawed people like Abraham and Abimelech. He'd used their fear to provide for this woman so his promise would come true. That's a remarkable thing. It tells us something about the sovereignty of God in our lives. And you might be someone who is going to work tomorrow or you might be in a relationship or a family where it's pretty tough. I can remember working for situations where I'd park my car or the company car in the car park and find it very difficult to open the door on a Monday morning. I've worked in those places. And at those times, what's your, what's your primary thought? I must be in the wrong place. God doesn't seem to understand what this is doing to me. Oh, yes, he does. That's how sovereignty works. There are incidents in your life. There are pains in your life. There is even persecution in your life at times. But there are incidents, but there are no accidents. God, the sovereign God, seems to use the free and stupid decisions of humans and their bad behaviour and their worst to make a collage of salvation history. And he eventually forms the stepping stones through which the church comes to be saved and plucked out of oblivion in history. We've got to take a longer eye view of our lives and God's great scheme of things Everything that's happening to you today, everything you're learning at university, everything you're, you're picking up as skill sets in your work life, God will use.
those things are not wasted, as onerous as they might be. Well, let's uh, wrap this up. Where do these characters crop up again? If you read the rest of this book, and we're going to draw this to a close next week, Isaac is born, he grows up, has a lovely relationship with his mum, has Jacob, who then becomes Israel. Uh, he has 12 kids, and, and then Joseph um, is the, the one who is the favourite of his dad. And one day he's put in a well, remember that story? He's put in a well by his brothers to persecute the, the living daylights out of their little uh, trumped-up brother. And um, who should come along but the Midianites? the grandchildren of Ishmael. And he's sold to the Midianites who take that kid down to Egypt and the children of Israel end up going down and Joseph saves his brothers in Egypt. You see, it's all part of this one onflowing story. It's a wonderful story of God's providence and his salvation history which is not able to be knocked off uh, the rails. I just find it fascinating that... For 400 years, the children of Israel are in Egypt and they lose their status and end up being persecuted just like Hagar was. It's fascinating. And finally, they're liberated and they go into the desert. Now, the Lord understands human nature and he knows that when you've been persecuted, it can scar you and make you nasty. And so when the Lord gathers his people in the desert, in the Exodus, He gives them certain laws that they're to carry out. He gives them twice when they're first in the desert and they wander around for 40 years and then he gives them Deuteronomy, the same things the second time, fleshed out a bit more. Deuteronomy means second law. And uh, and it's interesting that if you look up in the laws, the law of God, you'll find these words, and you shall not, not wrong the stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, that's the reason, and shall not afflict any widow or orphan. It's fascinating that the Lord has been here before. That sounds like another story, doesn't it? The affliction of widows and orphans. If you afflict him, I will surely hear his cry. Sounds like Ishmael to me. And my anger will be kindled. And then 40 years later, he he puts it in the form of the curse. Cursed is he who distorts the justice due to the stranger. Now, what I find really interesting in all these laws and the laws when they're quoted by the prophets is that they're always in the singular. He doesn't say, don't treat strangers, a group, a certain way. It's always the stranger, the stranger, the stranger. And you know what the words for the stranger are? It's the Hebrew word Hagar. That's the word, the stranger. I just find it incredible that in the law of God, which is meant to govern the people of God forever, that this, the, this, this woman sets the precedent and the precedent has become the principle. That our God has a real soft spot for the oppressed, even those who aren't part of his family. And I think this has got something to do with Mission 101. The Lord knows he needed to teach his people that there is a real danger that when they become powerful again that they will recommit the signs. It's, 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 if A oppresses B, then B, when they get on top, will re-oppress A. The, the victims of Monday become the oppressors on Friday. That's human history. It's human psychology. We just build up such degrees of resentment. But the Lord says we're going to break the cycle of resentment. We're going to be a different sort of people here. And uh, we're not going to treat the stranger that way ever again. You know, it's sadly in church history that precedent has been forgotten, lest we forget Serbia, lest we forget Northern Ireland, lest we forget the country of revival, Rwanda, They forgot that principle and the bloodshed that flowed is heinous. We need to understand that principle. In our lives and in this church, we need to understand Mission 101. We can misrepresent the heart of God. The heart of God cannot be... We cannot confuse the gospel 
with the political economic liberation of oppressed people. People can be released from oppression and they still need the gospel. They still need to be reconciled with God. You aren't saved by your victimhood. That's not a magic bullet that gets you into heaven. But I think we conservatives are even liable to commit an equally mistaken sin. You cannot constrict the compassion of God to just salvation alone. Compassion is not something you do to save people. People deserve compassion because God is the God who hears the cry of a child. That's the God we worship. I, for the life of me, don't want the job. I don't know how he bears it, hearing the cries of kids tonight in Ukraine or in northern Nigeria, the decimation, pointless decimation of human potential. But we have this one God, and he's got a heart on the one hand, it's one heart, it's a heart to save, and a heart to be compassionate and providential to even those who don't even give him a second thought. That's the sort of God we have. And that's what affects our mission. And my goodness, haven't we got a living illustration of that amongst us tonight in the form of the Jennings family? That capacity to hold both together without confusing them, that indeed is the mission God has given us all. We have a good God. As we reflect on that, um, let's take, take the thoughts that we have in response and um, let's look to Jesus and ask for him to um, help us to see, help us to understand um, how we can uh, be a group of people that truly hear the, the cries of Hagar who's around us. Um, let's stand and sing together. all of our time.
fix our eyes. We fix our eyes on Jesus, our perfect Redeemer. You're the author of our faith. You bore the cross, our sin, our shame. So we fix our eyes on Jesus, our glorious Savior. This might be a new song for a lot of people tonight, so feel free to just listen through. It's not too complicated, but uh, feel free to join in when you feel comfortable. be afraid. I will not be afraid. I will not fear. No, I will not fear. I will not be afraid. I will not fear. No, I will not fear. For you are a shield. For you, oh Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory. You lift my head. You lift my head. For you, oh Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory. You lift my head.
shield about all of us. Thank you that you are the God who sees. You are the God who hears. Thank you that you see each one of us, you hear each one of us. And thank you that we can trust in the assurance of your sovereignty. Knowing that in you all things hold together. Knowing that you use us in all our darkness, our weakness, our failings, our hurt, our stupid mistakes. Lord, you take us, you use us, and you are weaving your beautiful collage of salvation history. This mighty narrative of salvation and compassion. Lord, would you lift up our eyes? Help us to see where you are at work. Help us to see that that long view, that glorious perspective. Lord, as we head out into a new week, give us eyes to see, Lord, where you are at work. For the times where we are struggling, for the things that we may be dreading as we go back into a new week, whether it's in our work, our study, our relationships. Lord, you see it. And for those moments where we are just bogged down in the details of our struggles, wondering where you are and what good could come from it, let us remember what we have heard tonight, the assurance of your sovereignty, that in all things, Lord, you are working for your good. And we can trust in your good and precious promises. You, O Lord, are a shield around us. You are our glory. So we lift up our heads as we go out this week in thanksgiving, in worship, and in praise of the God who sees and the God who hears. And we can pray all of this through the precious name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Well, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for Jeff for that word, Luke and the team for leading us so beautifully, for everyone else involved. It's been such a wonderful time of sharing together around God's word. Be blessed as you go out this week. But while the service is finished, uh, certainly this time of fellowship and community is just beginning. Please stick around, find someone you don't know, introduce yourself, and the coffee cart will be up and running. So grab a hot drink, and enjoy this time of community together. Let us go out in peace and hope to love and serve the Lord. Bless you all.